Welcome to the Back Pain Podcast with Rob and Dave, the only show geared specifically to help educate you about your back pain. We talk to the experts to bust the myths, break down the science, and give you all the top tips for living pain free. So, if you're driving to work, tidy in the house, or even laid up at home in pain, we have something for everyone. Okay, guys, welcome to the Back Pain Podcast. Today, we're sitting here with Derek Griffin. Now, Derek is a, uh, and let me get this very, very right, Derek. Uh, Derek is a specialist musculoskeletal th- physiotherapist with expertise in chronic pain disorders. Does that sound about right, Derek? Yep, perfect. Fantastic. Uh, I only managed to bungle that a little bit. Uh, So today we're going to be talking about chronic pain, uh, a big question on a lot of our listeners' lips. Uh, I mean, for this, Derek, we're mostly going to let it rip and and let you go with it, mate. I don't think uh, we'll be chirping in too much. You are the expert on this. Um, But we'll we'll guide it through from the beginning. Derek, great to have you here. Uh, Can you take us through your day? So what does a, a specialist musculoskeletal physiotherapist with expertise in chronic pain disorders do? Yeah, so I'm working in um, in Southern Ireland in Kerry, um, and it's my in, in in a town called Tralee, which is my which is my hometown. I'm working at the Bon Secours Hospital. It's a private hospital here in the town. Um, so the majority of my caseload is to see people that have some form of of chronic or persistent pain. So I work closely with um, with the local rheumatologists, um, the orthopedic teams, for example, um, and most of the people that I would see have generally seen people or practitioners prior to seeing me um, Mm. as part of their journey through um, chronic pain. So it's really from working with a very wide variety of people with various conditions and many of the other healthcare providers that I've had the opportunity to work with. I suppose you, you develop your own knowledge and skills through that. Absolutely. Um, So what route does someone land at your door, Derek? You mean in terms of referral pathways? Uh, uh, yes, I guess so. Yes, yes. So how, do, how does someone end up seeing you? Uh, would it be straight to you? Is it via surgeon first? or yeah, Both. So I, I, I see people directly with, with, with self-referrals, but um, a high percentage of my caseload would be via... Um, as I said, I work with some of the, the local rheumatologists and the orthopedic surgeons, so via the consultants um, and, and then the general practitioners um, in the area as well. So many different routes. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fair play. So uh, so with that, both the private referrals and those uh, uh, cross referrals, if you like, you've got to see a pretty wide range of patients through the door then. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's the nature of chronic pain that, you know, it's a very it's an umbrella term for a variety of different presentations and conditions and we, we have to see people as individuals rather than as a as a diagnostic label mm, absolutely rob so, so that um well you i know you've used the term chronic pain you know should we start off by kind of breaking down what you mean by chronic pain i know that you know that term is used interchangeably with persistent pain Um, But obviously, some people might not be aware of what chronic pain means. I know a lot of people think that it means the intensity of the pain or, you know, that it's much worse than acute pain when actually, obviously, it refers to a time frame. So in in your words, how would you define chronic pain and how does that differ from other types of pain? Yeah, so I I think the acute versus chronic pain is very much a research um, um, distinction or, or, or definition. So chronic pain is generally defined as pain that has persisted for at least three months. Um, others would define it as pain that, that goes beyond the usual time that we would expect an injury, for example, to heal. Um, I, I'm not really sure whether the difference between acute and chronic pain helps me in the clinic because, as I alluded to previously, it's really about the individual in front of me. And, and as any good clinician, it's about taking a thorough history and doing a thorough examination to arrive at what that individual needs rather than seeing this as how long they might have had pain for so you, you don't diagnose someone as, as a you know air quotes chronic pain patient just because they've had three months of pain or pain that's gone on longer than you than you would have expected normally no because there's i suppose that that's why things could often go you could, things could go missed because you'd assume because they've had the pain for a certain duration that it's not something it's not something else so it's 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 about 
you know, listening to their story, doing a proper thorough examination and and then putting all those that together to 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 come up with where we need to go with with the treatment plan. Brilliant. So then I know that we just mentioned previously the 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 distinction between chronic and persistent pain. Why the change from you know healthcare professionals using persistent pain as opposed to chronic pain? Is that just because of the terminology associated with it or the, the scare factor associated with it? How why was it changed? Yeah, I, I think chronic it, it, again it depends on what the word chronic means to a, a, an individual. If if mm. if somebody understands chronic to mean that the pain has been there for a, a long time, then that's probably not as it's not a problematic term per se, but unfortunately there's a lot of negative connotations that go with the term chronic. I suppose sometimes people use it as, as a descriptor of their pain rather than um, a means to define the duration of their pain. And then there's a lot of beliefs that come with the terminology as well, that, that chronic pain is something that we can change and it's something that you have to learn to live with, for example. And so I, I think persistent, while you know it's not, it's not the perfect term and some people might have uh, some have issues with it with a term like that as well but it, it it probably talks to the longevity of the condition that this is pain that's going on or persisting so it you know it probably makes a little bit more intuitive yeah. sense no yeah. that, that 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 makes more sense to me so if you're okay i mean can we break down exactly a little bit you know obviously we're kind of scratching the surface on a hugely complex topic what is pain in terms of you know something hurts why does that hurt? And that can be from back pain. It can be from a stubbed toe. You know, how does that manifest itself as pain? Okay. So I suppose there's two separate questions in there. There's, there's the, what is pain bit? And there is, to, there's the question as to why does something hurt? So okay. I to answer the first base around what is pain, you know, pain, it's, it's an interesting question because intuitively we all know what pain is without without putting a specific definition on it so everybody has had the experience of pain and they'll talk to you about their pain without specifically putting a, a as i said a definition on it so it's a very academic debate at the moment as to how do we precisely or how do we define pain that that captures the complexity of pain but to me a more important question is is how does the patient understand their pain and, and of what meaning does it have for, for them and, and how it affects what, what they do about it. And that leads nicely into the second bit of that question is to, you know, why does something hurt? And, you know, I suppose I'd like to um, preface this by, I suppose, acknowledging that as pain science has evolved, there's, there's been some questions that have we allowed the pendulum to swing too far towards I suppose, non-physical factors involved in somebody's pain. So just because pain has gone on for a long period of time doesn't in any way mean that issues in the tissues or, you know, I suppose, traditional things that we would have considered to be um, involved in pain are no longer relevant. And, and of course they are. But I, I think what we've learned, and this is probably the key message that patients need to understand or the public need to understand and I, I don't like using the term patients because pain is a societal problem it's not you know that people have beliefs about pain regardless of whether they're currently experiencing pain or not and and I suppose the prevailing model of pain is that pain means that you have an injury or there's damage and the more pain you have it means that there's more damage or injury and and we know that while while an injury or changes in the tissues of the body can be associated with pain there isn't a one-on-one -on -one relationship so you know this idea of how you can have lots of changes in the body and have little pain and you can have a lot of pain without you know without having any obvious injury um, or, or condition to to explain that so i think the key message to patients is that there are many factors that are involved in why something hurts and sometimes that is because there is an injury or there has been a trauma for example but sometimes there are many other factors that that um that account for that or at least contribute to that and 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 we know nowadays that things like our lifestyle so you know including our levels of activity including our sleep behaviors anxiety for example stress um but even going back to before someone develops pain, things that happen earlier in your life, major life events can can change how that nervous system behaves um, it, it going into the future. And, and, and all of these factors can combine to 
I suppose to answer the question, um, why does something hurt? And, and I suppose finally on that topic, this is where, again, going back to a comprehensive evaluation of the patient is important because when somebody comes to see me, it's, it's about through their story, identifying, is there anything here that needs further follow-up? So did this patient have a trauma? Is there signs from their history or from their examination that you know there, there is an issue in the tissue or for example a, a runner that has suddenly increased their mileage and presents to the clinic with something that sounds like a stress fracture you know these are things that we tease out in the in the clinic but i suppose for a vast majority of people with a persistent or a chronic pain problem often these specific injuries or, or issues in the tissues are not identifiable and this is the challenge. How do, we, how do we best explain to people with pain that we need to see this in a, much, uh, in a much broader picture and that everything that's really happening in our lives can contribute to your question as to why does that hurt? Yeah. And it, I mean, that kind of helps explain, as you said, those issues in the tissues. And I think, you know, what, what you're referring to there are, as you said, the, the damage to the tissues, you know, in some cases, yes, that causes pain and that can be if you know if you if you stab yourself in the knee with a dart there is an issue in that tissue and it causes pain however some people have some issues which show up on scans and you know all sorts of things which aren't necessarily all as always ha aren't necessary whilst they could be a factor in the pain aren't the causative factor of the pain i think getting the, your head around that when you've been told you've had a disc bulge or you've been told you have you know arthritis in your spine that that's not going away and then you always have this this mental picture of what your spine looks like and then that controls everything about your pain experience your your beliefs about it and as you said there are so many factors involved in pain um so what is becomes the tipping point then from an issue in the tissue to be letting that pain become chronic so what is the you know the the switch that gets flicked if you will if there is one that means a pain goes from an issue in the tissue to becoming more of a, a chronic issue. Is there something which you can pinpoint or is that again, all of these complex factors together? Yeah, I think, look, you know, there is a, there's a whole pile of complexity that underpins that. I think an important point here is that, you know, when we talk about short lasting pain or acute pain that or new onset pain, however we want to describe it, we shouldn't assume that that, that is a t an issue in the tissue per se. Mm. So, you know, we, we take a very obvious example of, you know, a sprinter that tears a hamstring. You know, there's a very clear mechanism that fits with the, the, the presentation. And we can, we can usually safely say that, you know, high speed running caused overload of the hamstring and resulted in a tissue injury, yeah. you know. But if we look at how a large percentage of acute back pain presents, you know, up to two thirds of people won't attribute it to any specific event or cause. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that, the issues in the tissues are not relevant here, but just because it's the pain has only been present for a short time doesn't mean that we shouldn't again look at the whole picture and look for other factors that might have been going on, for example, in someone's life around the time that they um, that they developed pain. But I suppose to look at your question specifically around like why why doesn't pain go away? Um, again, there's there, there's no single answer to that. And, and I suppose there's lots of potential reasons why that happens. So we obviously know that the nervous system and the immune system are very adaptable systems. So these, these are the systems that generally respond to a, a specific injury that we might have. Um, but over time, depending on how much change is happening within these um, systems, they often, they don't always revert back to their I, I suppose the the state they were in previously. So we don't always know why that happens. There's potentially a genetic predisposition in certain individuals, but we also know that you know things that happen, for example, earlier in your life. Um, like there's there's a body of research to show that children that have ha experienced more pain in childhood, whether that's due to medical procedures, surgeries, etc., are more at risk of developing um you know a heightened response within the central nervous system you know mm -hmm. later in later into their adult life so you know there's a lot of i suppose predisposing factors around genetics and and life uh, life events but then we look at how do people how do people manage and cope with their pain in in that acute phase you know so 
what are their expectations of recovery? Do they do they see their back pain as something that means that you know they're going to have back pain for the rest of their life? And and they've had an MRI scan that now shows degenerative disease disease, and uh, and they may know somebody that had a similar presentation that didn't have good outcomes. And you know, th- there's all of these factors at play as well as things like exercise levels, how how well people are sleeping what what other things are going on in their life and that might be work related it might be family related you know a lot of the social factors are are are, are involved here so there's this huge interaction between our beliefs our behaviors how we cope with pain as mm-hmm. well as you know how the nervous system and the immune system are are responding to all of these factors that ultimately tips the balance in favor of the pain persisting or not revo- not resolving so you could almost have two, I wouldn't call them injuries, but two episodes of pain, <clears throat> should we say. And depending on how so many factors in your life at that moment, a very similar episode could on one hand get better and one hand persist for a bit longer than normal, just based on so many other life factors when in fact the, the episode is very similar on, on, on first look. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's true not not only between different individuals, but for the same individual at two different points in their life. Sorry, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, yeah. the same individual. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, absolutely. Because over time, people's life circumstances change, people's coping mechanisms change, people's beliefs change, and and and, and that I suppose it's that complexity that that makes that that adds to the clinical challenge of how do we identify people early on that might end up in this trajectory? And if we could intervene earlier with a more specific treatment approach, then could we ultimately change that trajectory? And this is, so what I'm, I'll try and do is put myself in a patient perspective mind. And some of the questions which I said myself, Dave and I get asked on a, on a regular basis, and almost put them to you a little bit in terms of, I know that we said that, you know, the back pain can have certain onsets and some things will then make it worse, as you as you described. But if a patient then says, well, I didn't have any back pain, I, I lifted a lawnmower and I hurt my back. And then I, you know, I was laid up for two weeks. I had an MRI scan. They showed I had a, you know, large disc bulge. I had surgery on it and the pain went away. So from their perspective, they had there's their, an injury onset and then a procedure that fixed their pain. You know, how will that, how does that fit into that model of, of chronic pain, which can then have so many other, you know, they could also be depressed, they might not be, you know, how does that fit into the model? Because there's clearly a, an onset with a pathology that may or not have been there. Yeah, so I, I think it's very important that we validate patients' experiences. So in, in, in a situation like that, it's, it's, it's important that you, you know, that you give the patient their own, uh, their own space to voice what, how, how they see their presentation and if if, if somebody um I, I suppose the scenario you gave if somebody had an episode of pain that was attributable to a a lifting event or a, you know they bent down awkwardly and 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 developed sudden onset su- sudden onset back pain and they have followed um i suppose a very a positive trajectory in terms of their outcome it's really about just giving them an alternative perspective to consider rather than being very didactic with, 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 with that approach. Because in that situation that you described, it's quite possible that there is an element of you know, issues in the tissues that were initially uh, flared up in that initial event and then, and then resolved um, o- o- over time. So I'd, I'd be reluctant to, be, um, you know, to, to try to challenge it excessively, except when if there's a belief that that's apparent from the clinical conversation that looks like going forward, this could become really problematic. So, you know, it's, it's about looking at the overall picture and saying, does, is this patient at risk going forward? Does that belief really, you know, is it worth challenging? And if it is, then it has to be done very gradually rather yeah. than saying, no, that belief is wrong. And now we know that, you know, that what we see on the scan is not predictive, um, pre- predictive of, of outcome. So that's a very nuanced answer. But, yeah. you know, I, I suppose what you're, what you're getting at is that when we're challenging beliefs and behaviors, that we shouldn't be too confrontational always in how we, in, in how we do that. It's, it's providing the patient with an opportunity to reflect on the situation and look at other potential ways that, 
might have led to the resolution of their uh, of their pain yeah i i totally understand that and i think that explaining this topic is so hard and i've had patients i'm sure we've all had patients who have come to us and they said you know they they have a very outdated model of of why they get better or why they get injured whatever that might be and they they might you know every time they sleep with the window open they you know they their neck goes out or whatever it might be and then they see a bone setter who puts their neck back in again and you know and, and they're right as rain straight away so they have these outdated beliefs which again as far as they're concerned it's not their fault it's just it's, it's their belief so challenge them straight away immediately puts up a wall between you and the therapist as well so between you and the patient or the the person in pain so you know challenging someone's beliefs slowly over course i think is is vital but as you said if you're having these beliefs and this you know as far as you're aware the patient has lots of yellow flags or warning signs that this pain might become chronic i guess it's more important to kind of pick apart those beliefs and understand why they why they feel that or how they feel a certain way and i think it's important that this is where listening to the patient gives you a lot a lot of valuable information because one of the i suppose one of the key features of motivational interviewing is picking out bits of the patient's story that mm. that almost contradict or at least go against their 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 um I suppose their broad understanding as to why they why they got better, and it's 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 about using that bit of information as a tool to get the patient to reflect on and say, well, yeah, you know, if if that was the case, then how does that explain something else that might have been going on? And that yeah. that's where the clinician really has to listen and and use the patient's own story to challenge their beliefs, because then it's really their story and they can they can reflect on that. It's not somebody else that's just giving them this information that they can't relate to. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. The example, of, the example I used of, the, of the, the wind, you know, causing neck pain or the, the window open with the neck pain was my very first ever patient in private practice. And I, this elderly lady, lovely lady sat down and said, oh, when I slept with the, I slept with the window open last night and my, my neck's obviously hurting. And I had, I look, it must have looked like I had three heads. I was going to look to her and said, well, I don't, why? You know, was it a really heavy window? You know, why, why you couldn't open it? What happened? And she said, oh, because of the draft. And I was, I, I said, kind of said, I, I carried on and talking to her about it. And afterwards I spoke to my, my boss at the time and said, you'll never guess what this lady just said. She, you know, she thought she slept, had neck pain because she slept with the window open. And he says, oh, he said, you hear that on a weekly basis. You know, he said, it's a really common that sleeping with a window open and having a draft causes your neck to seize up, you know, and it's a, and then challenge that belief. And I said, well, how, what about the wind? You know, when you go out in the wind, does that not, does that, you know, we, I said, we picked about that story and, you know, you can slowly pick apart those beliefs and kind of get patients on your side, I think. It's, but it's, it's that dig deeper, isn't it? To then say, okay, well, it must've been a warm night then. Does that mean it was so hot you were in the garden? Oh yeah, well, I planted 500 bulbs. Oh, well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's trying to kind of like dig that a little bit deeper from uh, Derek, like you said, that, that initial perception, but they've, they've got a little bit, which they've ignored. I planted 500 bulbs, but it was definitely the window. Um, and then like you said, pick that other bit and then sort of bring that to the light a bit more perhaps. Yeah, it's, I suppose we're all human. They, it's, it's human nature to try to find one specific cause of pain because it simplifies things and it, and it gives people a sense of understanding and control. But mm. I suppose any good clinician, as you, as you just alluded to, will, will bring patients through their story and, and, and give them an opportunity to reflect on what might have been going on that day, but even in the weeks leading up to that. And to really just, it's just like planting a seed. It's not, it's not saying your explanation is wrong. It's giving, <laughs> yeah. them, it's giving them an alternative um, way of, of, of looking at that. And, and again, getting them to reflect back on their, on their story. And there was a qualitative paper um, a few years ago. I'm not, I can't remember when, but it was published by um, uh, Dr. Cormac Ryan's group, who is a, a researcher in, in Teesside University. And they, he's done a lot of work on um, explaining pain and, and how, how best we do that. But I suppose they were looking at what do patients value around uh, the explain pain paradigm or concepts. And, and one of the biggest things was making, making the science of pain relevant to the individual. So we can say things like, you know, pain isn't a good measure of damage and you, you're, you, know, you, you can have pain and it doesn't mean you're harming yourself. We can say all of these things, but, but without putting that into context, it's very meaningless to the patient 
So they're not going to they're not going to come on board often with these new explanations. So again, going back to what we've been just discussing, if we can link some of these key concepts with the story that the patient has just told us. And more importantly, get get the patient to link all of these things and but through self reflection, um, etc. Then I think we can make inroads into how do we how do we best get some of these concepts around pain across to patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when when you say self reflection, is that do you mean pain journaling and describing the experience of a pain day to day and those type of things? Yeah, it can be, but sometimes it's just giving the patient an opportunity to tell their story. You know, some some patients or a lot of patients with chronic pain, and this comes out in the qualitative research, have not been listened to. They just haven't had an opportunity to tell the story because they've been labeled as somebody that has chronic pain or fibromyalgia or whatever term they've been put, whatever the term is, um, has been put on it. And instead of seeing these people as individuals, we start to see these people as a as a diagnosis. And, and that's never helpful. You know, mm. so it's about just saying to somebody, look, you know, tell me the story and first the first consult with me i will say i will tell people a lot of what we'll do today will be just talking i need to understand your story i need to understand your values your you know how how you make sense of your current situation before i can do anything to change that or help you and mm-hmm. and patients are okay with that because they've seen a lot of different people they've had a lot of different things already you know um they they I think deep down they know that there needs to be something different uh, and, and they're, they're happy to go with that. So one thing we hear a lot from patients and this might be, you know, for those listeners and I'm, I'm, you, you might not be aware of it, we have a um, uh, Facebook group. So the Back Pain Sciatica UK support group. I mean, it's a, about a thousand people in there. And one thing we hear a lot and people posting in there as well is, obviously you know therapists whether they're physios chiros surgeons whoever it might be who have tried to explain this pain mechanism and all the things you know it's not a bone that's out of place it's not just a disc there are lots of bigger elements going on here and the patient takes very little of it in often because it's been explained very poorly and they come back and say i saw a physio they tried some of this pain science stuff and they all said it was in my head and it's something which you know they they've narrowed it down to you know the physio thinks I'm making it up. And it's something that I said we hear a lot, you know, of someone who have tried to explain it. What do you say to the patient that says they don't believe me or the, they're saying the pain is in my head where, where I know it's because I've got this injury or no, I've, you know, whatever this pathology I've got on a scan is. Yeah. I, I think a lot of that comes down to the, the, I suppose, how we, how we talk about the, brain or the mind and the body as as these separate entities you know so we we even do that with all good intentions by talking about mental health versus physical health you know so we we tell we ask people you know how's your how's your mental health but you know if i give you it if we talk about depression for example Mm -hmm. we know that there's there's a lot of peripheral changes in the physiology that are associated with having depression that depression doesn't start from the neck up you know, it's not just a brain condition that there's a whole host of factors uh, at play. So, you know, when when I whether I'm talking with students or other therapists or or the patients themselves, it's important that what I call that we we biologize the psychosocial. You know, so when we talk about things like stress and and social isolation and worry and catastrophizing and rumination and all of these things that that you know we we, we talk about in the pain world. All of these factors are actually having an effect on how your neuroimmune system is working. It changes things like, you know, your levels of inflammation. It, it has an effect on your, your, your cardiovascular systems, for example. So, you know, I, I think rather than saying to somebody, you know, pain or stress is an associated factor with pain or it's contributing, it might be contributing to your pain, that we give them some sense as to how that might be happening you know, that it, that it's changing the, 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 the physiology, that it's not, they're not imagining it. And maybe we can use analogies here, you know, so something that and it, it's probably a bit of a simplified approach, but, but I think it's helpful. You know, if, if someone is seen by a, you know, a cardiovascular team because they've had a history of a, they've had a heart attack or they've had a, they've had a stroke, for example, they will generally be counseled on many various bits that might have contributed to them developing the the stroke or the heart attack and that might include things like 
you know, their medical conditions. They might have had a history of uncontrolled high blood pressure. They'll probably get counseled on nutrition and the type of, you know, the type of diets that increase or reduce the risk of, of these conditions. Mm -hmm. They'll, we'll talk with them about levels of exercise and physical activity. We'll talk with them about how stress can, can, can drive some of these changes. So, you know, my question to a patient is, why are we happy that stress can increase your risk of having a heart attack, but not increase your risk of having pain? Cool. You know, so we, we can use these kind of analogies as a way to, again, to really biologize what we're talking about rather than having this as a very kind of a, a concept that the, that, that the patient can't relate to. That, that would be my perspective on it. But it is a very difficult thing to to avoid this idea that's <clears throat> in your head that's such a good i've never that's such a brilliant explanation i think that's a really good way of putting it i said hmm. so many of other physiology you'd use to explain all sorts of other medical conditions but you don't see pain people don't see pain as a medical condition so it's it's, it's changing the narrative of pain i guess isn't it as which is your job you know it's just which is yeah. why, <laughs> what, what you do Absolutely. so you know that that's kind of brought me on to the next question when then which was why stress depression anxiety do change pain but i said you've kind of answered that one quite well because it's changing the the actual yeah biology of of, yeah. of 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 what happened of of your pain i guess and i i think also to answer that is you know when we talk about stress and depression and anxiety we we look at how do how do people cope with that and what effect does it have on their behavior so you know we know that some of the pathways from anxiety or depression and stress to pain can be through things like activity avoidance. So if somebody has low mood or they're anxious, they might, they might avoid exercise or they might avoid uh, social um, interaction. And, and that further has a profound effect on the biology. You know, mm -hmm. so there, there's a direct effect on the biology, but there's also these indirect effects through how people cope with, with these things. And, and this is a, a very important clinical concept because you know, therapists will often say, well, you know, I can't change the fact that somebody has a lot of stress in their life, you know, whether it be family stress, work stress, financial stress, etc. But the evidence is, is clear that the stress is only one part of the equation. It's the coping skills and how people respond and cope with stress that ultimately dictates the, um, the, the effect on its health. So we can talk about things like factors associated with resilience, which will include things like exercise, looking at um looking at good sleep habits cognitive behavioral interventions um mindfulness um nutrition you know beliefs optimism those those kind of things so even when i can change the fact that someone's life situation is is challenging or difficult mm. there's always ways that we can look at how do we, <clears throat> how do they cope with that better or how how do we get them to manage that situation better which, which again changes the, the, the physiology. That's really interesting. So it's not the removal of stress. That's your, not your job to go around, shout at their family for them and you know, uh, put money in their piggy bank, whatever it is. Um, but it's the, the reaction to and the coping mechanisms that deal with that stress, um, uh, which then have the knock-on effect. Uh, so you can have a lot of stress and yet, um, if you can deal with it well, if you can react in a positive way to that same stress as someone else, yeah. you're not going to have those, those knock-on negative effects so for anyone sitting in the car right now listening to this beeping the horn don't react calm it down uh, it's how you react to that stress which is causing the problems that's yeah. really interesting and, and, and i think that goes the same for things like you know patients might might be aware of being told they're fearful of their they have a lot of fear avoidance behaviors or or they're mm. catastrophizing the situation which is which is really an awful term for just something that involves you know it's excessive worry or rumination and i prefer to use that term rather than catastrophizing um but I, I, you know something that i say to patients a lot is that you know you're a human this is a normal response to having to the situation that you're in and and you know yes we can look at can we change that or can we can we find a better way of doing that but you know we have to avoid this blame game that you're in pain because you're avoiding exercise or you're in pain because you're not sleeping and really understanding that it's it's not as simple as that patients are not making these active choices not to sleep or to be fearful of what's 
uh, of their situation that they're in. That's, you know, that that's a very complex, multifaceted um, problem. But we have to be sure that we have this blame free narrative and that we try to see it through the lens of the patient and give them uh, the opportunity to, to, be, to be listened to and tell their story. Quite. So because pain has these huge multifactorial input, is that one of the reasons why often painkillers can be very poorly used or are very ineffective at managing chronic pain? You know, yeah, that, I suppose that's, that's one potential reason for that. But, you know, the, we, we've spoken about just how so many things are involved in the, in the experience of, of pain. Mm. You know, it, it makes little sense to me how we can, um, you know, I suppose a, a, a particular medication or a painkiller is, is only ever able to target parts of that puzzle, you know. Um, and most of these medications are generally acting on the nociceptive system, which is a, a fancy scientific um, word to basically talk about the danger systems that we have that we have inbuilt in all of us that respond to things that are happening in our body. And, you know, if, for example, if I sprain my ankle, this system is going to be upregulated and, and may contribute to the experience of pain. Um, and, and I suppose we have a lot of, there's a lot of drugs that are, I suppose, trying to mess with this system or to wind this system down or whatever um, explanation we use for it. But again, that system is only one part of the puzzle that it, it you know, it's not the same as pain. Pain is a much broader um, construct. So there's so much else going on in somebody's pain then that, that we're, we wouldn't expect something, um, any one thing to really have that, that profound effect. Hmm. So, what, so, it, what, so when you're in clinic, sorry, Dave, do you have a follow up to that? No, no, I'm just, I'm just sitting here absorbing. Really. <laughs> yeah. So when you have your patients in clinic and you, as I said, you're unpacking them, as well as the, I said, looking at their, their diet, their lifestyle, their activities, and kind of helping them understand why things might be you know, severe or why they're experiencing this pain state at the moment. What else do you find yourself using in clinic to, to help them improve? Is it exercises? Is it journaling? Is it meditation? Is there things which you use more frequently than not? Yeah, I suppose it really depends. My, my preference is always to look at a very active way of coping with the pain and and when the patient leaves the clinic that that we have set one to two goals normally I'm, I'm not a big believer in setting too many goals too early because you know the the information can be very overwhelming to somebody with chronic pain they you know if we talk about sleep and exercise and mood and diet and and coping skills and you know work-related stress and life stress you know I think sometimes the patient may leave the clinic thinking, you know, how, how can I possibly change all of these my, things? My, my whole life. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So if we, if we try to pin down one or two very realistic goals that the patient may be able to achieve, you know, I, I, I think that's a success because the other thing that is important to understand is that if, if we want to change some of those factors that I've just mentioned, we don't have to see them as, entirely separate factors so if we get people doing more activity for example we know that that can be a, a mechanism by which they can cope with their stress and it might actually improve their sleep in the long term so it's not it's not as if we have to give them one intervention for sleep and one intervention for exercise and one intervention for their mood and and another intervention for something else that you know all of these things can have multiple multiple effects so i suppose i'm really looking for that one or two things that i can that i think will be able to change the most things but being realistic about that situation um as well so i do i, I think one or two goals short term is is where we need to be going no, and as, as you said, yeah, that getting someone to increase activity, you know, increasing mood, you know, decreasing depression, decreasing anxiety, that knock on effect of pain. It's that trying to hit as many birds as you can with one big stone, I guess, or what, or kind of <laughs> one big goal, I guess. Yeah, one exactly, big stone. Yeah. Is that, yeah, no, I totally, totally understand. One big bird? No, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So, how, when someone has been in this experience for a long, long time, are you able to give people prognosis in terms of prognoses of are they likely to get better? Does that, you know, what factors do you give to someone before saying they're likely to be out of pain or is that not something you do at all? 
Well, I, I suppose what I, what I talk to them about is what I can change and what we can change. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not dwelling on the factors that may be involved in their pain, that, but, but I can't change that. So I, I'll always reframe it around, yes, there are all these things. For example, things that happened earlier in your life. Obviously, we can't have any effect on, on that, but we can make sure that, you know, that they've seen the right people to address these problems or that they're coping with the situation as best or as, you know, as they can. Um, but in terms of prognosis, you know, I, I, it's very difficult to say to somebody, you know, how much reduction in pain, for example, they're going to have or, you know, but I think it's about being having an open discussion. And, you know, I'll, I'll say up front to patients that pain is a very difficult thing to change. Mm. While, it, while it does change, and, and we do have evidence to say that, you know, pain can change, it generally takes a very long time to see that effect. And, and I think that's very important because if the expectation on the patient's behalf is that this exercise program or this walking program is going to change, help me reduce my pain in a fortnight, and, and, and there's actually no change, and there might even be an increase in pain, <clears throat> in the very short term when people are when people are doing a new activity for example excuse me um that this can be very off-putting and they often bail out in treatment very early so i think it's about saying yes there's a lot of things we can change and there is a there is a good chance that if we can change these things that based on the science there's a good reason to believe that we can change your pain there's probably better evidence to say that we can improve function you know, a little bit quicker than we can, um, than we can change pain, but, but pain and function are, are still very much linked. You know, they're, they're not these separate outcomes that we, that, um, that, that have differential effects on, on, on terms of what patients, um, do. I, I do think some like patients do value pain relief and, mm. you know, in, in some of the recent literature, <clears throat> you know, I, I do wonder at times, are we undervaluing, pain relief as the treatment goal and have we settled on this idea that pain is difficult to change so let's focus on living well with pain rather than the pain itself and and part of that i agree with i i, I do think that the living well with pain concept is 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 good and has many has many benefits um but it it does make this assumption that it's you know we can just live a normal life regardless of what pain we have and mm easy to say when you're not in pain as a clinician to tell people so I, I i you know the my my approach is yes we can we can improve function and we can we can teach you to you know we can teach you to manage and cope with the pain but to me pain relief still is is high up on my um on my list of goals and also on the majority of people that i see hmm. do you ever have to no help patients then in, on that side of it come to terms with the fact that they might not ever be out of pain because some people might sit down and say you know doc get rid of this pain you know i've had this pain for 15 years won't give up give away and if you're approaching the end of the oh, end of the line's the wrong the wrong phrase but in terms of you've done as much as you possibly can how do you help someone come to terms with the fact that as i said they might not ever be free from pain and that's what they're they're clinging on to that they want to be back to where they were when they were 18. Yeah, I, I think we have to have that discussion very early on. So, you know, in the first or second treatment, it's about being open to say, look, it's hard to know how much the pain will change. There's a good chance it can change if we if we do A, B and C. But, you know, having those expectations set up early on is the key rather than promising the patient the sun, moon and stars. And then suddenly, you know, that doesn't work out. And then saying, well, there's nothing more I can do for you <coughs> send you to the pain management program. Mm. And this is often this is often what we see in the clinic that there's almost this well physiotherapy didn't work or or whatever other practitioners um, the chiropractor didn't work or whatever and therefore if it didn't work well there mustn't be a solution so I'm going to send you to the to the pain management program you know mm. and this we we have to say well look you know there there might be there might be somebody else that I feel they might be benefit from seeing that, you know, I mightn't have been successful in shifting their beliefs or, or getting as much change as I would have liked out of them. And, and perhaps that's just because for whatever reason, you know, 
the concepts that I was trying to get across didn't come across well or didn't come across properly. And they might be somebody else that they can, they can relate to better that might do a, a, a different job than me and maybe explain it in, in, in better terms. So I'm quite open to the fact that there are other people in the community, other healthcare professionals that might explain things a bit differently to me, but actually for that patient, it, 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 it's really helpful. So we, we yeah. have to be more open and, and not think just because I didn't get them better you know, and because my role is to see these people and if I can't get them better, well, then they, you know, there's probably nobody that will get them better and then they should see the, they should go to the pain management program. We need to leave the ego at the door and, and, and see <coughs> the value that they bring. Yeah, so that's sure quite a, <laughs> indeed, a, a clinician flaw sometimes, the, the sort of a single room God complex. Well, if I can't fix you, <laughs> surely no one else out there is better. Um, yeah, a bit of a, a personal flaw in us all sometimes, I think. Um, uh, Derek, can I bring you back to, to something you said earlier? Um, and this was about when you're re-embarking on an exercise program per se, it, it was that reoccurrence or re-emergence of pain. That, um, and I've actually heard you talk about this before. Um, uh, that, that sort of initial relapse, that, that return back to pain. Um, now, for, for the average patient listening, that can often spark alarm bells. That takes them back to that initial point. We often hear the, uh, the, the, the eternal words uttered, I'm back to square one, you know, my pain is back. Um, how, can, how can we kind of understand this a little bit better? How can we get around this idea that that's me, I, I should stop everything, you know, that that's me back to square one? Okay, so... To me, the key, the key with that is before embarking on any such exercise program, mm. the, the patient needs to have trust in you. You mm. know, so I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, for example, it's something as simple as having a flare up plan, because I'm quite open with people, especially for people that have very high levels of pain and, and their, their pain is very irritable. So it's very easily provoked. It's constant. You know, these, this will come out through the story. If that's the case, you know, it's important that we sit down early on and say, you know, as part of this journey, there will be episodes for whatever reason where we do get an increase in, in pain, you know, mm -hmm. and that's most likely at the start of the journey, if they're going from doing very little um, to, to, to suddenly doing more. Okay. So what we generally try to do is, you know, have that trust developed early on and have a plan for if this happens, how am I going to, what am I going to do or how am I going to deal with it? So immediately we give people control over their situation because we know that pain, pain flare ups are less severe and they last for their duration is less when people have control over the situation. Okay. Hmm. So the, the, the second thing then is we, we try to, we try to set a realistic baseline and, you know, patients will intuitively know what a flare up means. So they'll, they'll know the difference between what we consider their everyday or their usual pain yeah. and the time where there's a, there's a significant flare up. Okay. Mm. So for me, a flare up is when the pain or their other symptoms, and we keep using pain, but there's a lot of, I suppose, fatigue and other things that, that go with these chronic pain conditions. Uh, a flare up is really, to me, defined when the pain is at a level that impairs people's ability to function. Okay. And that might be, yeah. It might be they can't sleep. It might be they can't go to work. It might be that they have to go to, you know, they have to stay in bed all day to reduce the flare up or, or that means they have to take their, they have to rely on medication to reduce their pain. Okay. Hmm. But, but there's probably a, there's probably a line someplace between having an increase in pain and reaching the point where the pain gets so bad that it, that it really flares up. You know, yes. so, and that's, that's the bit that I try to tease out. So it's, it's not always easy, but I think mm. if we follow the general principles of, you know, where I start, I'm, I'm less interested about, I'm more interested in where we end up, you know, and the public health guidelines around exercise and physical activity tell people that they need to be exercising for 30 minutes a day at a moderate intensity, at least, and they need to do that five times a week and yeah. very well-meaning and at a population level you know, a good general goal. But for somebody, particularly in clinical populations, often entirely unrealistic. Yes. And we have really good evidence that tells us that the benefits of exercise and activity start well before you meet those guidelines of 30 minutes per day. You know, so most people oh. will get most benefit from going from very, very inactive to doing a little bit of exercise or a little bit of activity. 
Mm. So that's a graph that I show people before embarking on these programs, because if somebody believes that they're not hitting 30 minutes and like, why would I bother going out and walking for three minutes? What's that going to do for me? You know, that can be a barrier to getting them to be more, more active. So it's about, you know, giving them the message that no amount of activity is too little. And this yeah. isn't about hitting a specific goal day by day. And that we can, you know, there's a lot, there's some things we're putting in place to try to minimize the risk of a flare up, but should it happen, here's what we're going to do about it. And if you do flare up, we'll learn from it and we'll use that information going forward to try to help us. Fantastic. Though. That is our soundbite right there. No activity is too little. Um, uh, like I said, if you're walking for three minutes a day, it's a start. It's an initial, literally, quite literally, a first couple of steps on that road. Um, yeah, don't go straight back into your 10, 20, 30 minutes. No activity is too little. I love that, Derek. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. So fantastic. I've got, I've got, I've got one more question before we uh, wrap it up and <laughs> give you back your evening, your Sunday evening. <laughs> the, we will, Obviously, we are, we're the back pain podcast and we speak about back pain as if it's almost, you know, patient, people speak about back pain as if it's almost a normal thing to be chronic. You know, my father had back pain. They've always had back pain for years. Why is it so much more prevalent with back pain than, say, ankle pain? You know, when someone sprains their ankle, and I used that analogy earlier, no one assumes that that's going to be there for life. Whereas when someone, you know, slipped a disc or, you know, sprained their back, is that because of those predetermined beliefs often? Or is there other factors at play that mean it's much more, lot more prevalent in back pain? Yeah, well, I suppose it's a, it's a very interesting question. And, and I suppose one that... Um, that we don't know all the answers to, but one of the big things with that has to be societal beliefs around back pain. You know, so if we compare beliefs in, the, in, in general society among the general public, everybody, everybody has some belief around back pain. You know, they'll even, even children going to school. So we have, we've conditioned them to think that, you know, a heavy school bag is harmful for your back or, you know, sitting in certain postures at school is harmful from your back. So from a very early age, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things we read and hear and are told that are very much geared towards, geared towards your back. Mm -hmm. So it's probably an area of the body that society for whatever reason has, has honed in on. And, we, and there's a lot of negative um, baggage that, that, that comes with that. So, you know, it makes sense to me that if people have all of these negative beliefs and attitudes from a very early age towards back pain, and at some stage later in their life develop an episode of back pain, that, that these beliefs will, will definitely have an influence on, on how you respond and how you perceive that, that, that back pain and, and the coping mechanisms that you employ to, um, to deal with that. So, you know, I often say that back pain is, an, is a societal problem. And if we're going to make inroads into that, we we'll, we have to shift beliefs at a societal level that it's that it's not enough to try to change the beliefs of every patient that we're seeing in the clinic because we can only do that on a one to one basis. But you know, the the big question is if we could shift these beliefs at a population level, mm -hmm. you know, what effect would that have on 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 our approach and how we uh, and disability rates due to um due to back pain um, so you know there, there's probably lots of reasons um, as to why back pain per se is the is is the big problem that it is but a, a part of that has to be that the beliefs around back pain are for are very very different than somebody that that, that sprains their ankle mm. yeah absolutely I mean I've used that analogy in clinic and you know trying to unpack pain with patients and asking about ankle sprains have you ever sprained an ankle pain an ankle and this analogy I use a lot in terms of that and it's and it's it's a, it's a really hard question to get your head around and as you said those society pressures of you know yeah. society what's what I'm looking for things that which are ingrained to you as child the sort of attitude towards it, straight, it yes yeah, yeah. You sit, sit it straight to hurt your back or unpack your school bag yeah. too many heavy books you'll hurt mm -hmm. back you know, those are almost a given on there you know they you know it's just ingrained in our society so as he said unpacking the whole of society it might take a while but i'm sure it can happen yeah i think mm. at, at, you know at, at various stages of the lifespan we're we're introduced to some of these negative beliefs you know when when you come to a working age then we do manual handling courses and again well-meaning but sometimes the message that comes through this is that you know we're we're going to hone in on on your back because your back is you know 
fragile. So, yeah, it's fragile and we need to teach you how to how to mind your back. We don't teach people how to mind their ankles or their or their shoulders or their you know, so it's it, it makes sense to me as to then why why back pain is is such such the problem that it is. Sort of almost that, that, that bigger rev, reverence given to uh, back pain, um, both from a behavioural and a, uh, a treatment point of view. Wow, that's going to make history is a lot harder, Derek. When did your back pain start? Or well, when I was four? Uh, I think, I think <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, I think clinicians can play into that as well. Um, mm. You know, we, you know, some clinicians talk about back pain differently. We we tell people that you know you need to get these things seen to early before they become a problem. Um, you know, th there's some evidence around, you know, in the whiplash associated disorders literature, in the absence of red flags, early additional treatment or early aggressive treatment worsens your outcome, for example. You know, so sometimes the the good clinician will screen people, will do a good assessment and, and advise them and reassure people and not not give them this sense that, you know, this is something that requires intervention because frankly, the evidence isn't there to say that you know, if over natural history that, that, you know, in, in some of these more, um, particularly in the non red flag presentations, which are the vast majority mm. of people that, you know, earlier excessive intervention actually does anything to change, to change the outcome. So it's not just patients beliefs. I think it's how the patients beliefs marry up with the clinicians beliefs. And sometimes that's a recipe for disaster. And other times we can, <laughs> we can break that, we can break that belief um break that beliefs through reassurance and 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 good education yeah i love that that's another yeah. another great soundbite <laughs> yeah um one last point i'll be really really quick i promise the uh um the populations that we've spoken about are largely have been around musculoskeletal pain do you deal with chronic pain from medical conditions i guess anyway any way you put it so more inflammatory type conditions so rheumatoid arthritis type chronic pain and do those patients perceive their pain as, as any different um, compared to a, a chronic musculoskeletal back pain that you might use? Yeah, so I, I would see um, a relatively high percentage of um, people that have, that have a, a, an underlying inflammatory condition. The most common that I would see would be rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis. Um, so clearly in these conditions, it's very important that their their disease is under control so we would work closely with the rheumatologist in 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 that situation but you will find that in you know in in um i suppose in in a percentage of, the, of these people that <clears throat> their their disease is under control and they're doing very well and they're not they're not burdened excessively by um by pain or, or loss of function but you'll also have a group of people where their their inflammatory disease is very well controlled yes yet they're still presenting with with a lot of pain and functional limitations be because of that um mm -hmm. i suppose the mechanisms underpinning that are very complex but the recent literature again is pointing towards that while an inflammation might obviously be a contributing factor into how the how the nervous system and the immune system is behaving that even once this is well controlled that the system itself can still say can still remain very sensitized and and often these present these patients will um will present with more widespread pain they'll have they'll have a lot of fatigue and 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 we would use a very similar approach with these people than we would in the non-inflammatory um population because ultimately i suppose the thing that's different is that their disease needs to be managed as well and and that's generally done very well um through the rheumatology our rheumatology colleagues so from my perspective it's still about trying to figure out the various what what other factors might be going on other than their rheumatoid or other than their psoriatic arthritis for example that might be changing how this how the nervous system um is behaving you know perhaps for a smaller subgroup of people that there's a, just a genetic predisposition and you know it's not moderated or mo modulated by by anything obvious that we can that we can tell there you know i suppose they can be unlucky and that you know the the initial disease of uh, or the inflammation that goes with it just really causes the nervous system to behave in a very um sensitized manner uh, but but again it comes back to the basic principles of looking at a person's life story listening to them trying to identify in addition to your rheumatoid or your psoriatic arthritis what else can i change be it exercise behaviors, be it lifestyle, be it sleep, and really giving them an understanding that it isn't a simple case of just control the inflammation and 
you know, they, they, there won't be any pain. So, um, I, yeah, I think it's a very interesting area. It's an area that's that's developing at the moment and, and we're starting to get more literature about. Um, so we, we should know more in, in, in the next few years, but I don't see it being very much different than what we've just discussed. Yeah, no, I mean, I was wondering whether it had a either a better or worse outcome, or not I mean outcome, but in terms of because they have a disease to pin it to, you know, oh, that's my rheumatoid arthritis, whether that, you know, changes their perception compared to, well, I didn't do anything and now I've got, a, you know, I've had back pain for 10 years. You know, it's a very different kind of initial mindset and wondering how that changes the roadmap of, a, of their yeah. pain journey. And that can be positive and negative. So it, yeah. it, it can help people because they have, they have a diagnostic label. But, but I suppose the danger is that they assume that because I have something like rheumatoid arthritis, that, that I'm definitely going to have pain because mm. of having an inflammatory condition. So, you know, we have to tailor our intervention or our education depending on on how the person is understanding their condition and if it's helpful if they understand it in a very helpful way that's adaptive and you know reassuring them that this isn't anything you know serious and that you know it's it's only it's inflammation that's causing my back to hurt rather than something being damaged or out of place and it it gets them moving then we probably don't need to challenge that whereas if they see it as this chronic condition that is just adding to the adding to the problem and they can't control it then that's where we need to intervene so again, it's going back to that reaction to pain um, and that that self understanding and self um, uh, uh, self attribution of this pain is because of this. Either I go down route A, which is I think this is bad, or route B, I understand I will control it and I will act accordingly. Um, so yeah, again, it's that it's that reaction to and that adaption to pain. Yeah, it's, it's the behavioural response that I'm interested in. It, it's what mm. effect is that belief having on how they're managing their pain, and if if that has a very positive effect, great. There's no need to challenge it. Mm. Amazing, fantastic. Right, I think that wraps it up <laughs> in my end. Yeah. <laughs> Unless yeah, my, mind is, more no, I, my mind is no. blown. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for joining us, Derek. And thank you for giving us uh, taking time out of your valuable Sunday evening to, uh, to chat to us about something which you'd <laughs> spend all week doing, I'm sure. So uh, thank yeah. you very much for, for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to us. No, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And, you know, look, I, I think it's an, a lot of the things we discussed is, is important to discuss in the open and, and to have patients involved and get their perspective on it, I think is always a good thing. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Derek, if people want to hear more from you, um, are you uh, uh, a Twitterer, a Facebooker, or uh, anything like that? Where, where can we find you? Yeah, so, so Twitter would be my preferred social media outlet. So it's at Derek Griffin um, 86. Um, on, I'm on email, Derek Griffin Physio at gmail.com. And then through my work contact, I'm in the Bon Secours Hospital uh, in Tralee in County Kerry. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to discuss anything with, with, with anybody if they, if they require more information on it. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and, and are there any resources that you regularly turn people to that you can advise would we'll be good to go and have a look at for anyone who might be fear they're in this chronic pain category? Yeah, so again, going back to I suppose what we discussed it's around targeting the right resource to the right to the to the right patient so rather than just giving them a whole load of YouTube videos or websites to go to but but there's a few that that um that that I would use from from time to time so there's the there's the tame the beast.org website which is um which is the work of Lara Mosley and colleagues um in Australia and it's a very patient-centered um as well as clinician centered website there's a lot of useful resources there's the there's the pain ed website that's headed by um Professor Peter O'Sullivan and, and, and his team, um, again, from, from Australia. And, and again, the, a lot of these websites touch on some of the various topics that we've, that, that, that we've discussed. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's various books and there's some YouTube videos, um, et cetera, that, that, that are quite useful as well. But I, I, I try to pick the right resource for whatever it is that I'm, that I'm trying to, to change. Brilliant. Fantastic. And uh, for anyone out there who um, has had neck pain from sitting too close to an open window, please send all your emails to Rob and your hate mail as well. <laughs> <Lovely>. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Right then, guys, uh, that was an awesome episode. We fitted a lot into an hour. I'm surprised we managed to curtail it to an hour, quite frankly, because yeah. pain could go on and on. Um, I, I smell an episode two somewhere down the line, Derek. Uh, thank you so much for joining yeah. us.
no problem. When when does it come out, or what what's the schedule normally? Ah, oh, so um, uh, that's a great question, Derek. Uh, we should be within the next two weeks. We will be releasing. Uh, so for those of you listening, we're currently recording in the beginning of May. Um, so this episode in particular should be about uh, end of May, I hope. Okay, perfect. I'll, yeah. I'll keep a lookout. Absolutely. We'll let you know so you can uh, uh, tell all your fans. Yes. <laughs> Marvellous. Thank, Derek, thank, thank you so much. Good to chat. Talk soon. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Bye now. Cheers, Bye. guys. Bye-bye.